The congregation, please rise. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. God spoke these words and said, I'm the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods but me. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Honor your father and your mother. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not murder. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not commit adultery. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not steal. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not covet. Lord, have mercy upon us and write all the eternal laws in our hearts, we beseech you. 
Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no help in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent, according to your promises. Declare to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish have everlasting life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise. That among the swift and varied changes of this world, our hearts most Surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be seated. First reading this morning is from the book of Jeremiah, 31st chapter, beginning at the 31st verse. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I shall make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with your fathers on that day, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, 
declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach uh, his neighbor and each his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Our psalm appointed for today is Psalm 51, beginning at the 10th verse. We shall read responsively, responsively by whole verse, saying the Gloria Patria at the end together. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. I shall teach your ways to the wicked, and sinners shall return to you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from Hebrews, beginning in chapter 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. As we stand for the reading of the gospel, children ages four through second grade are invited down to Children's Church. They'll return during the passing of the peace. Please stand. <laughs>
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. One of our shared griefs, a deep grief, in the early months of COVID was a pause in our partaking weekly of Holy Communion as we do here. As I sought perspective in that season, I reminded myself and shared with some of you that morning prayer has at times been the primary Sunday worship service in Anglican churches with communion offered once a month or so. And there are churches today in our wider communion in which morning prayer is a part of their Sunday worship rotation. If this surprises you, let me take you to the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, which sounds thrilling, I know, and it actually is. There was a canon adopted with regard to the frequency of receiving communion, which I'll share. But first, and this is a complete aside, I'm going to share a few others. One canon they adopted forbade patrons of churches from killing their rector. <laughs> that was actually proposed, discussed, voted upon. I think they made the right call. Another forbade sons of clergymen from assuming their father's office. And just for the record, the prohibition on clergy marriage had been in place for some time. There was another canon that forbade the wearing of pointy-toed shoes. But to our point, among these canons, was one requiring every baptized member of the church to receive communion at least once a year. 
This was a response to a problem. The average person in those days was petrified to receive the body and blood of Christ. He could go years without doing so. He was content to watch the clergy partake on his behalf because he did not want to risk judgment for receiving in an unworthy manner. This reluctance had two roots. One, very specifically, was a passage in Corinthians which had been received without any real thought to the specific situation which Paul had been addressing. And then second, more broadly, was a distorted image of God in which God was the scrutinizing and unpleasable father belt in hand. So when communion was offered, people hung back. It was an altar call without a response. The average town priest was complicit in this. He too questioned the worthiness of the laity to receive. It would not be long after this council that the chalice, the wine, was removed from the people. In time, there was protest on this matter and others. We call it the Protestant Reformation. But corrective ordinances don't eradicate centuries of fear. The reluctance of the laity to receive weighed heavily on the heart of Thomas Cramer as the Church of England became independent of Rome. Contrary to popular belief, this was not just about a divorce. There was a substantive theological break, which had been stirring for decades on English soil. Ashley Null has written a great booklet, which I commend, on how Cranmer sought a liturgical solution to lure the people back to the communion table. This is how the comfortable words those four scriptures came to be added to our liturgy after the confession. Now, if you could add a fifth comfortable word, a fifth scripture, what might you add? My choice is what we read today in Hebrews 4. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. It is because he is without sin that he can be our propitiation. It is because he was tempted that he has sympathy for us in our failures. I want today for us to consider the sympathy of Christ, beginning with these temptations that he faced. Likely the first thing that comes to your mind is that capital T set of temptations which Jesus faced after 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. This was momentous, it was the reversal of Eden, but it was not the first or last time that Jesus was tempted. Most of the time, it was not Satan standing right in front of him saying, it's me, Satan. Jesus also faced the everyday provocations that needle and poke us, tempting us to sin. Consider, for example, the calling of the Twelve. Many years ago, my work for another church involved organizing groups of four to twelve people, but some groups were self-formed, and these self-formed groups had one thing in common. Every person had relatively decent social skills. There was never a truly offensive or disruptive or even just really awkward person in their midst. Who did Jesus choose? This was an incredibly dense group, always missing the point, even for not having the spirit. There were some things we look at and think they really should have gotten that. They turned children away. They wanted to call down fire on people. There was actually a, a Roman collaborator in the mix. 
and Judas is what we would call today toxic. These were not the only 12 men in Palestine. Jesus had other choices. Men more intelligent, with better people skills, greater humility. Given the same options, who would I have chosen for my staff and core group of friends? But Jesus went with the 12 men who could best represent those dysfunctional 12 sons of Jacob from their early days to their later metamorphosis. Consider Jesus' rejection in his hometown. We're told he could do no miracle there. This was not because he lacked ability or authority. It is because signs are for those who believe. Jesus was not going to use them to salvage his ego before a cold crowd. I would have wanted to prove myself. Jesus allowed room for gossip. Consider how Jesus responded to the crowd who crashed his vacation. He was trying to have a private retreat with his 12. They were wiped out from ministry. They arrived to find thousands of people waiting for them. What would I have done? Boundaries? Cloud and Townsend? When to say yes and how to say no to take control of your life? It's a great book. But Jesus discerned that the will of the Father for him in that moment was to postpone his vacation and feed the sheep, not for 30 minutes, but for three days. The faithfulness of Christ is such a contrast to my gut responses. It's almost hard to believe that he can understand how I feel. But I read something recently that helps me to grasp this. This book is an autobiography written by a figure skater who competed for 12 years at the international level. It turned out to be a bit dark, but this piece was helpful. She describes re-watching a competition from a low point as she was preparing to write. And in this re-watching, she was struck by what one of the commentators had to say about her lack of mental toughness. This commentator was also an Olympian who won gold at 15 and immediately retired. The author of this book has a strong reaction to this criticism, and she goes on for pages about it, so I'll just summarize what she said. What does this one-hit wonder who competed in a child's body coming in beneath everyone's radar, what does she know about sustaining mental toughness through years of physical change, fighting to retain titles, prolonged expectations by your country sometimes met and sometimes failed, along with international scrutiny and a never-ending carousel of younger competitors? Who is she to say, I just need to snap out of it, to decide to skate, and to say all of this without any knowledge of the trauma I was experiencing at home. Now, when I read this initially, my first thought was of parenting. Like many of you, I was never so much at the top of my parenting game as before I had children. I was the commentator. Eighteen years later, I'm careful where I turn in challenges. Has this parent ever been to the bottom of a well so deep they know advice can be a ladder too short to save or that one careless word could crush? When we're struggling, we want someone who's been there. What the author of Hebrews is telling us is Jesus has been there. He gets it. He has been tempted in every way as you have. He not only knows your frame, that you are dust, 
but he entered into that dust himself. He knows the fatigue you bring to temptations, the physical hunger, the needs that have been ignored by others, the wounds. This is why we don't have to explain our sin. We have only to confess it. And Jesus doesn't excuse it, but he does understand it. And he atoned for it. I had a season myself in which I sweat over receiving communion. My teenage years, some weeks more than others, I didn't want to draw attention to myself by not coming forward, so I would walk down the aisle thinking to myself, hypocrite, hypocrite, hypocrite. It was not until college that two things came together for me, changing this forever. One, broadly, was healing in my image of God. The other, very specifically, was my exposure to the right one service. You may not know what that is, and that's okay. But there's something in it that you do know because we do it here. And that's the prayer of humble access. I am not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table. But thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Mercy is the antidote to shame-based fear. And I want to close with a word on shame as it relates to Hebrews 4. Shame has a purpose. Shame shows you your guilt. There's a clinical name for people who lack shame. It's sociopath. The question is what we do with our shame. Do we confess our guilt for expiation? Or do we hold that shame in our arms, coddle it, nurse it like a baby, enshrine it? To nurture our shame is in no way honoring to God. To do so is to say that God's heart is hard and that the blood of Christ is insufficient. To believe that somehow your sin is beyond God's compassion for the contrite is a form of narcissism. It's also idolatry. The moment we believe that our guilt is greater than the blood of Christ, we have ceased to worship our Lord and begun to worship our shame. We've made it into an idol and placed it in front of the throne of grace, blocking the path to our very source of help and strength. This is why in our battle against sin or in any challenge, whatever the nature, you cannot stand on shame. That ground will not hold you. Whatever you are facing, if you do not stand on the rock of grace, you are already defeated. If you are stuck in some habitual sin or haunted by some singular mistake of the past, or you just carry constantly with you that Margot Robbie, Barbie sense of not good enough, my question for you is this. Have you considered ruminating, not on your failures, or your perceived deficiencies, but on the mercy and sympathy of Christ, making that your obsessive thought. Can you allow yourself to do this, or do you fear that this way of thinking will turn you into a hedonist or a sloth? It is one of the enemy's greatest lies that a fixation on God's grace will make us more wicked. 
The psalmist writes, With you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Grace elicits love. Love gives birth to trust. Trust gives birth to obedience. An obedience rooted in a clean, pure fear of God. A fear that can barely stand under the gravity of his mercy as we bathe the feet of Jesus with our tears of gratitude. And so, as we read today, let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find, find what? Find grace to help us in time of need. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Would you all stand with me and let us give voice uh, together to our faith and love of the Lord as we say together the, the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified in the Pontius Pilate, he suffered death in the grave. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Almighty God, you do not desire the death of sinners, but rather that we may turn from our wickedness and live abundantly. Grant us repentance leading to a knowledge of truth and enable us to lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely so that we may run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, Lamb of God, forgive us, Lord, for failures in Christian service. Exhort our bishops, priests, deacons, and lay leaders to speak the need all Christians have for continual repentance and the offer of pardon as set forth in the gospel. We pray for Foley, our archbishop, and for Steve, David, Thad, and Terrell, our bishops. We pray for our sister church, St. John Baptist, and their pastor, the Reverend Dr. Jamie Graham. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Andrew's Park Circle, North Charleston, and their pastor, the Reverend Dave Liven. In our ministry cycle of prayer, we pray for birthright ministries. Lamb of God, Forgive us, Lord, for failures in government, 
humble, guide, and protect those in positions of public trust. Joe, our president, Henry, our governor, Daniel, our mayor, and all elected representatives. Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Forgive us, Lord, for failing those in need. Exhort us to defend and comfort the poor, the lonely, the imprisoned, the sick, the fearful, the addicted, the depressed, and the hopeless. We pray for those who are suffering. For Pansy, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. forgive us, Lord, for our failures in justice and concern for the world. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and for your healing among all the peoples of the earth. Open our eyes to the injustices of our society and guide us in righteousness and healing where sin abounds. Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Forgive us, Lord, for all our failures in the thoughtful care of our resources and for our consumerism leading to the waste and pollution of your creation. Lamb of God, have mercy on us. O Lord, we groan inwardly as we await eagerly the redemption of our bodies. In this hope, we are saved. We pray for those who have died in the communion of the church as they have realized the blessed hope of eternal life. Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Gracious God, thank you for leading our search committee to a faithful pastor who will preach the gospel, care for your people, equip us for ministry, and lead us forth in fulfillment of the Great Commission in his service as Dean and Rector of Church of the Apostles. We ask for mercy and grace upon Father Eric and his wife, Laura, and their children through their time of transition guide us as a parish in welcoming them lamb of god have mercy on us o lord full of compassion long suffering and abounding in steadfast love we thank you for your mercy in sparing us the punishment that our thoughts words and deeds deserve accomplish in us your work of salvation that we may show forth your glory in this world. Lamb of God. Have mercy on us. Father, grant these prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 And let us take that, that grace and sympathy and mercy that God has brought into our lives and make it tangible to those around us. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. Welcome everybody today uh, to the Church of Apostles, and it's just good to be here worshiping with you. Uh, if you're new, let us know if we can help you in your walk in any way. If you have questions, please let us know. There are cards in the pews. You might want to fill those out, and we'll be glad to get in touch with you if you'd like that. I, I want to just take a, a minute, this unique time that we are uh, in, in in our lives in the church year, and ask you if you turn in the bulletin, there's, a, there's an insert in there 
and it has to do with this time in, in our life, which is Holy Week and Easter. I'm sure maybe you know this, but if you, if you read John's Gospel carefully, the last week of Jesus' life is literally almost half the whole Gospel has to do with this time. God will not love you any less if you don't come to these services. <laughs> but if you do come, there may be cracks that break open in your heart that let that love come find you more deeply. And so with that in mind, just uh, there's a lot going on. Very, very briskly, I just want to uh, say a few things. Um, Easter, at the Easter vigil, Saturday night, the, the, uh, the night before Easter, is our Easter vigil. It's also a time of, um, at that service, of baptisms. And I've said this before. And we have several people, it's a wonderful time, historic time for baptisms. If you have a child or a grandchild, you haven't been baptized and want to, just let me know. My name is John Barth. You can find my email in the, in the bulletin um, online and just let me know. We can talk about that. Easter lilies, when we come in here on Easter Day, so beautiful. It's a, it, that, just, just to remind you, it's a wonderful way of remembering people who, who uh, are not with us anymore, being thankful for people who are grateful for, uh, for their dedication. Uh, so there's dedication of Easter lilies. Um, Palm Sunday, bring a breakfast item. You can read about that. Um, um, bring a treat to break our fast, which is... Um, Easter even, Saturday night, um, and, and about kids, Easter eggs, you read about that. So we all really start Palm Sunday. That's next, that's next Sunday. thing you need to hear is it's, it's one service. Um, it's at 10 o'clock, and we will not meet in here. We'll meet out in the um, Hampton Street parking lot like we have, and we will process into the church. I don't think we'll have a literal donkey might do that sometime, but we will be singing, we'll be singing a song that will, uh, an opening hymn uh, by a line of people that's about five miles long, and the miracle is, is that everybody will end up on the same note and the same words. That's my prayer. <laughs> well, I'm just going to see. Uh, the tritium is the end of, that, and it could go into the week, um, powerful, powerful time in the gospel is, is Thursday night before Good Friday. That's Maundy, Maundy Thursday. You can read about that. We have a Eucharist here, the stripping of the altar, uh, the, that communion service is, well, you can imagine how powerful that is. Seder meals in homes, you can, uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about that. And then Good Friday on March 29, 7 o'clock, even song with lots of exquisite music and prayers, meditation on the cross. Man, we're coming into the center of our life here when we when 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 we kneel at the cross on on good friday just one you know these are just such major events that break through to us um and then holy saturday the great vigil with baptisms as i said break the fast party um and then easter day one major service festival eucharist at 10 o'clock and you can read about the easter egg easter egg hunt Two other things I want to do is just thank those people from our, our family here, the parish family, who've spent the last um, week, a part of this weekend, in Raleigh at another Church of the Apostles, Anglican Church, for diocesan synod. Once, uh, once a year, we all get together for two, three days for teaching, uh, worship, and prayer together, and be in the body of Christ in the Diocese of the Carolinas. It was marvelous. We had so much fun. Worship was great. The word was open to us. And uh, it's just good to know that we're not a, a solitary silo in the body of Christ, but they're brothers and sisters in other places we, we pray with. Um, Bishop Steve asked new clergy to come up who were not here from last year. I think, I don't think I'm exaggerating, I think about 18 new clergy came up. We're starting missions all over the place. Um, we received four new congregations into the diocese. I was stunned. I sort of knew this, but just seeing that and then hearing the stories of how these missions are, are, are happening, Edneyville, North Carolina, uh, Asheville, uh, 
you know, other places, going to other towns. It's just really beautiful, and we got to be a part of that, and I want to thank our delegates for going up. Last thing I want to do just is a, just a huge joy, and that is um, you know that um, God has opened the door that has been <laughs> prayed at for a good while, and uh, uh, Eric Spies and his wife, uh, Laura, and five children will be coming here like, like 16 June to be exact. Um, and I got to spend some time with Eric. It was just, just lovely. Loved it. You know what? It's been a long journey, my friend. I can tell you. It's been kind of a long journey. And uh, it's, it, it, we don't need to let the time go by without thanking the search committee. And I want to ask the search committee to come up and just stand, stand right and stand in front of the, the kneeling places here. If you want to know that some of our search committee members are out of town, one or two of them were at the 8 o'clock service, but if you were on the search committee, and that would include uh, Marcus, our chaplain, if you would come up here right now, I would appreciate it. And as they're doing this, um, I don't know if you thought this, or maybe as members of the congregation, you have some over, some over here, here, this too, here too, maybe you felt like this sometime. It's like, you know, poor Jeremy. Here he's got to give up and give a report again. He gave 35 reports on, on the search committee, and, and uh, you know, we, if God hadn't sent somebody yet, he still had to go up there. And, uh, you know, when we, we're, we're praying, I want us to do two things. I want us to, th there are more meetings in the shadows that you are aware of, um, visits, sensitive situations. This involves people that we're looking at, they're looking at, deep prayer, sometimes anguish, um, de um, depthful discernment, which is never easy. What is it? How? And, and you know, I, I'm lifting this up because we're a family. Everybody's smiling. This is hard. And I just want to remind us, my friends, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, it's costly. It, 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 is, it is not easy. It was not easy. It was joyful. It was service. It was powerful. It's meaningful. And that wonderful word, with, it's such a strong word in the Bible. God, the Holy Spirit, was with this group all the way. Lots of prayer. So the first thing I want to do of two things, I just want us to thank them. Thank them. It's been two and a half years. It will be two and a half years when Eric and, and Laura come. Joyful day. Uh, but can, could we just... Um, could we just give them some applause and some gratitude? Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear that? <laughs> Amen. Thank you all. And I've got to say to the congregation, you all have been amazing. Because you're sitting there thinking, what are we doing wrong? Why, don't, why isn't somebody here yet? And that white-haired guy seemed like he'd been around here a long time. <laughs> you know, and you all have been prayerful, you've been patient, and we, we've turned the corner, and God has brought us um, into this, this new place. So now I want to ask, I ask the members of the search committee if they would kneel, and I simply want to pray for them. And I want, I, we don't do this often, and you can, you don't have to do it, but as a sacramental outward invisible sign, would you just put your hands out as if they're, it's on their shoulder, and you're praying for them, and pray along with me if you would. Um, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we're so... Your mercies are new every morning. 
And sometimes there were valleys that we have walked through. And sometimes we just wondered whether we, whether we were doing the right thing or why hasn't a priest come yet. And there, were, there have been seasons, Lord, I speak for them, where, where it has felt de- you felt depleted or exhausted. And so this morning, Lord, I pray that this would be a time for this family and for this search committee who has served you and served us, that this would be a formal time of taking a a deep sigh and that you would open up the windows from heaven and fill this place with your breath. And I'm asking my brothers and sisters to lay down any burden that they may still be carrying or, or any exhaustion or anything that Keeps you, Lord. Keep, keeps them, Lord, from luxuriating in Your presence. And I just pray a time of renewal upon them, times of refreshment. May this be a time of refreshment, like those who coming across the wilderness in the Old Testament. That long journey. There were there were times in which the water burst out of the rock, and it was times of refreshment and beauty. I pray that upon upon our brothers and sisters here. Fill them with a new sense of joy. Bring the oil of gladness upon them and reestablish their hearts that they may walk with you with with gladness and singleness of heart. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, about my transgression. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, without my transgressions, would you Sacrifices of our God, God. the broken and contrite heart against you. me.
Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have you given me. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right. Our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Behold. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and we have given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink this, all of you. 
For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. So therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him and that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance. Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
stand together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are the living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. May God the Father, who does not despise a broken spirit, give you a contrite heart. May God the Son, who bore our sins in his body on the tree, heal you by his wounds. May God the Holy Spirit, who leads us into all truth, speak in your hearts words of pardon and peace. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
let us bless the Lord.